Hey, this is Matt once again. We're about to end that video, and this is a paid request for Ben. Thank you so much for that. For those interested in requesting any type of videos, PayPal is usually the best bet, or join my Patreon. The links are in the info box, wherever it's out on YouTube nowadays. And Ben wanted me to do a commentary on the 1982 film Alone in the Dark. So it'd be cool to watch this again. I do have subtitles on that way. Again, because of how damn hot it is here in Texas, like, everything is stuffy. <laughs> but, for those who are watching it, I have a pause to begin. For those who want to send in requests, feel free. For those who have, I'll get to them as soon as I can. And, again, yeah, pause at the beginning. 3, 2, 1, pressing play. For sinking, it's black. It's still black. <laughs> black is like black as day. Anyway, I knew I sent my logo coming up. Which I do miss that logo. I grew up with New Line Cinema films. Of course, this is like the newer New Line Cinema. Time Warp Company. And then we're blocked again. And New Line Cinema presents for same team. A Robert Shea production. Robert Shea, of course, the head of New Line at the time. Because New Line Cinema at this point was just a distribution company. I think Evil Dead was one of the films they distributed. Because I remember seeing that logo in front. And then they're like, hey, let's bait films. So what's a way to get into it? Low budget horror films because don't have to have a whole lot of money, but you market it the right way. They did get some bane for your buck. So this idea of what if a bunch of criminals, the original idea was what if some crazies got loose in the city and at the end of the day had to be rounded up by the mafia. But they thought, well, that's going to be a bit too much money. It's going to cost too much. So we'd have the crazies break out, but it's more of a home invasion. One city, I mean, a one house, a lot more manageable, especially for the budget. And they took the mafia angle out. We've been going to see crazy people versus the mafia. And this weird uh, dream sequence here. Where you really see the mindset of Martin Landau's character. Of just how he views and how paranoid he is. Of this doctor. Donald Pleasance. Who is like the nicest guy. But a bit too nice. But here, he's still viewed as the devil. <laughs> With this weird... I don't know what kind of knife you would call that. With the, the handle on top. Like the, the top part being that way. <clears throat> I love Donald Pleasance in this. But I've always loved Donald Pleasance. I mean, Halloween, Halloween 2, Steve from New York... Prince of Darkness. I mean, it's a dream scene, so anything can happen. But I'm sure people watch is going, what the hell is going on? Now, this is directed by Jack Shoulder. Now, Jack Shoulder, he was an editor. He edited... This was a big part of the trailer, I know. This whole bit here. Where they show this to just try to sell the, the possible violence that you would see. But of course, it'd be cut away right now. Alone in the dark. But before I get back to Jack Scholl, you had Jack Palance, Donald Pleasance, Marn Landau. What a cast. Dwight Schultz, who was Burdock. On the TV show The A-Team. Erlen Van Lith. Who was Dynamo and the Running Man. Before he passed away. I think he passed away the same year. As the Running Man came out. But we'll get to him later. But yeah. Josh Shoulder was an editor. And he helped work on editing The Burning. And then. Because of work with Bob Shea. You got him the job for this. And then this film helped lead Jack Shoulder get the job for 
Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2, Freddy's Revenge. Which I do like that film. And then later on, Jack Shoulder did The Hidden, underrated movie. Still hard to believe that still does not have a good special edition with all the extra features that just boggles my mind. And then he did Wishmaster 2. I know he did like the Giant Spider movie. I don't know the last thing he's done. But yeah, he's done a couple movies I've enjoyed. My favorite is between Elm Street 2 and The Hidden. And Dwight Schultz, I remember when I first saw this. Uh, I didn't see this as a kid. I saw this much, much later in life. There's Lynn Shea, related to Bob Shea. And of course, Lynn Shea have a career of her own being in the Insidious movies, among other films. She was in that Grudge remake. Came out a few years ago. And because she was related to Bob Shea, she appeared a lot of New Line Cinema stuff. She appeared a couple of the Elm Street films as a teacher, among other roles. But yeah, Dwight Schultz here, which he's got a bit of dirt on his forehead. It, it, I remember when I first saw this, it was on DVD. And at least I think. I'm trying to remember. It might have been that time, because it's hard to remember the first time you've seen each film. I lived in a different part of Texas, and that was around 2000... Between 2002 and 2006, and near it was a store called Hastings, which was the best store I've ever been to, because not only did they have... Again, this was 2002 to 2006. It was like the 80s or 90s. But they still had a ton of movies that you could rent, VHS and DVD. I mean, it was a huge place. Like, you could rent the Rambo cartoon on DVD. That's how specific, like, they were. And they had films like this on DVD and VHS you could rent. So it might have been that time. Or they would actually have very cheap DVDs because people could go and bring their stuff. And then if it gets sold, they get a percentage so a lot of times you do find stuff a bit cheaper. I remember watching it like, is that Murdoch from the A-Team? So I thought that was kind of a, a nice fun bit of business going back and seeing this. Because this, I like Dwight Schultz. And I'm a huge fan of the A-Team TV show. And then Donald Pleasant is just a, a, a fun as the doctor that just wants to hug everybody and be too nice and too kind. And that's sadly, his, that's his downfall. Too trusting... Not much in security, not much in just too much of a, a trusting nature, which uh, is a mistake. Which I guess is based on someone, I think a, a Scottish someone or something. You go breaking all the crap. Little girl with the pigtails here. You don't really see girls with pigtails anymore, just because that's much of a older thing, older ha hairstyle. But uh, nice that they made this girl not annoying or aggravating to listen to. So they they played it off the the right way. Just more of the inquisitive type. And of course, uh, Dwight Schultz here, a bit more of the Dustin Hoffman straw dogs. Although, sadly, he never goes the full arc of that, where he really becomes you know, down, you know, he never really gets that far, sadly. I think part of me was kind of hoping to see that, to see Dwight Schultz play, you know, tough and like, I can't take it no more. He's pushed to the limit. His glasses are broken. Kind of like I did Dustin Hoffman at Third Ass Straw Dogs, but 
they don't quite go that route. Now, Jack Palance, I mean, this is an actor that worked for so many years. It was a Shane and all this stuff back to the day. But this, I guess you say Jack Palance was in a slum. Just doing whatever work he can. That's how he was able to be in. A few years before, he was in Without Warning. Which kind of the... And there's the security measures. But yeah, which without warning was kind of like Predator before Predator, about an alien hunter hunting people for sport. And that also had Marn Landau in it, funny enough. So it's kind of funny. You got Jack Pounds and Marn Landau and another horror film, while well, that one was more sci fi. And Jack Pounds, when you look up, he didn't do a whole lot in the 80s. He did this film, uh, I mean, without warning, a few years before. He did a couple low budget films like Gore, G O R. And then what was it? Uh, there's a span he didn't work for like five years in the 80s. Uh, he, he was in Young Guns in 88. He was in Tango and Cash and Batman in 89. And then he did a couple films, Cyborg 2, until City Slickers, which he won. I think he won the Oscar for it, I believe. And they got him a bit more of a bump. He did the Cops and Robertsons, which I could watch for what it is. For Jack Pounds and Chevy Chase. I do watch. It's not a classic. City Slickers 2. Definitely stepped down from the first. And he did a few more until Sally he passed away. But I always liked Jack Pounds as an actor. Always did. And then Martin Landau, another great actor. My favorite story would be Ed Wood. Where he plays Bela Lugosi. Did a phenomenal job in that. He was in the first X-Files movie. He did a lot of stuff. Martin Landau. But it's sad that you know, a lot of these actors have passed away. Did Donald Pleasance. Jack Palance. Martin Landau. Erlen Van Lith. Very young. You know, Dwight Schultz is still around. But there you go. But I mean this is definitely a slow build. I mean, it's. Sorry, I got a message from someone. Sorry about that. But like, yeah, that's one of the, the big pauses about this movie. Like, look at this. You had this Donald Pleasants and Jack Palins and Marlon Landau in the same room. Now, of course, this guy, we don't see his face because that's the reveal for later. The bleeder, so to speak. It's just crazy you got all these great actors in one room. Definitely a big plus for a film like this. Now that big guy there is Erlen Van Lith. Who is in the Richard Pryor, Gene Wilder film Stir Crazy. I almost thought for a second he was going to do the Star Trek thing. <laughs> but that reminds me, I remember listening to the commentary at one point, Jack Palance like, well, I don't want to kill anybody. And it's like, okay, well, it's about criminal psychos going out and killing people, but Jack Palance wants to play a guy who doesn't kill anybody. But in a weird way, they kind of made his character more interesting because he is crazy. But he doesn't ever hurt anybody. He doesn't ever kill anybody. But he, he's the one who's like paranoid. And he's the one I kind of feel almost the most sorry for. Because he's in a world that by the end is as crazy as him. 
and you don't quite know what's going to happen next. That's what makes the ending interesting because you're like, what's going to happen next? Is he going to pull the trigger? Is he not going to pull the trigger? Is he going to go on a rampage? Is he not? So maybe feel sorry is, is the wrong phrase to use, but it's definitely the most intriguing. Definitely the most intriguing. And even at the end where he kind of looks around and he could try to do something, but he doesn't and he walks away. And I'm like, I didn't, I'm not saying we needed a sequel, but I will say there's a part of me that really would have been interested to see what happened next with Jack Palance's character. Really would have been curious about it. And that's just me, though. But yeah, Erlen Van Lith, the, that big guy, like I said, he was in Stir Crazy, this film, The Running Man as Dynamo. And then he passed away from heart failure the, the same year, 1987, that The Running Man came out. Which is too bad. But again, I'm sure nowadays there would be some people look into this film and go, wait a minute, well, nothing has happened for 15 minutes. What's going on here? But I, as a, I can only think for myself, as in I can only state my own preference, my own history, my own... Because I like these actors so much, it's just nice to hang out with them, especially how crazy Donald Pleasance is. I mean, he's the doctor, and you just say he's as crazy or crazier than some of the patients. Just to uh, <laughs> smoke weed. Well, I just, actually, that'd be typical nowadays. He was ahead of the game there. He was ahead of his time. He was ahead of his time. I don't know if I've ever heard Dwight Schultz talk about this movie. I, there has to be. Someone had to have asked him about it. You would think. I'm sure he's tired of talking about the A-team all the time. But it's like, how was it? You get to work with, you know, Donald Pleasance and, at least for a little bit, Jack Pal Palance and all that. Like, how, how was that? But yeah, this is looked at as a slasher film. I mean, I guess it kind of is, but at the same time, that could be very misleading. But I mean, that's how they sold it as. Especially the poster. Like, it's a, like it'll probably be over here, the poster. That's a really cool-looking poster. And I wonder, like, if someone looked at the poster... And then they see the film, if they're left with a bit of disappointment. Because that seems... That one... That poster makes it seem like much more grisly, much more gory, much more violent, much more down and dirty, axe wielding killer type of movie. While this, in a way, is more of a thriller. I mean, in a way, it is more of a thriller, more of a. Like, it takes a while for any slashing to come into place. That's a big mistake. This is all run by power, but what if you have a power outage? No one thought of that. Oh yeah, and the, they think that Dwight Schultz killed their previous doctor. And that's why they're paranoid about it. They're like, what happened to the other doctor? So they just assume that they killed, he killed the previous doctor. And that's why they go after him. 
and go to where he lives. Which you can't really argue, well, that doesn't make Well, they're insane, of course. It's not supposed to make sense. If it made sense, they'd be possibly sane. <laughs> but they're insane. And this is what I'm talking about, like, Donald Pleasant seems as insane as the patients, but it's a pretty fun performance he gives. This almost seemed like what a PC doctor would be in today's age. And it was ahead of the game and showing just how ridiculous the, the notion is. And yeah, Jack Palance is like a military general with his stance and arms behind his back and like kind of ordering people around. <clears throat> I mean, that's the thing. If you're going into this thinking it's going to be like Friday the 13th or I mean even by 82 you had My Bloody Valentine, you had The Prowler, like you had a lot of other movies, The Burning, that you would think it'd be like those kind of movies where it's not. It doesn't have a huge body count. There's not a lot of big gore gas that you can think of I'm one of the few slashing things I'm thinking of is the bed scene which was used in the trailer where the knife's going through the bed and trying to stab the, the person so yeah, again some people probably be deemed with disappointment watching this but I like it. It's not a film I rewatch a whole lot. It's not a film I, I. It's probably been years and years since I've seen it. But you know, if I watch it, like, oh, I like it. It's, it's good. Like I said, because of the slower build, which works for this film, but again, the slower build, the lack of your know, action and gore, excitement, it, it's. Those are usually the. Not all the time, but usually the films I rewatch over and over again. And it's not a film I get to you know, often. But again, the the actors it's well directed well enough. God, these literally all these eighties all the <laughs> the wardrobe. Especially this girl on the right here, I Ugly ass coat. Even that hairstyle. I don't even know why anyone would think the hairstyle was good to have all the hair on this side. And they don't know why anyone would think that was a good hairstyle. Look at that damn tumor come out of your damn head. <coughs> It's like Jack Palin's trying to put on this facade of being this nice guy, or... But it's like you see a real sense of confusion, maybe, of Jack Palin's character, or something that effect.
And that's why, I mean, I think Josh Shoulder said he he didn't mind working with Jeff Palance. But I think one of those things that, you know, he had some things at the start. But I think the fact that Jeff uh, Shoulder was willing to listen to him, work with him, maybe he was able to calm things down. And it worked out because it made uh, Palace's terror, again, more interesting. To be the most interesting of the group. While the others are just crazy. Him, he's crazy, but there's something else going on. And Is he confused? Is he conflicted? Is this all an act? Is it everything... And more. I don't think it's all an act. I think there's maybe a bit part of him. And we see that later on. But the same thing is is building up the the characters, getting to know them a bit more. Before it hits the fan, you know, after that dream sequence at the beginning. And that's why I just see it, I, you know, I just see either way. If people look at this as a slasher film, I can kind of see it, but if you don't, I just see it as well. This is where the, is this the punk club? I think so. I mean, they pretty much show that they're ready to, to drag the... <laughs> the look on Dwight Schultz's face, just... What the hell is this? Honestly, I'm tired with Dwight Schultz. I punk rock... There are exceptions, but it was never my favorite kind of music. I'm a guy that liked more rock and roll, ACDC, Metallica. Are there exceptions, though? Absolutely. There's always exceptions. And you need to do a lot worse than, than this this song. But it's not my favorite style of music either. And this thing is just bouncing into each other. I always thought it was just so damn annoying, obnoxious. I'd be like, I'm glad I was never around here. I'd be like, get the hell all away from me. <laughs> That's why you just don't go in the first place. Like, what the hell are you doing? Stop bouncing me. I'm going to punch you. Bounce off my fist. You want to bounce off this or bounce off my dick? You better pick soon. One won't choose for you. I think this is the same club that Jack Powell goes to at the end. So it may seem. And also, it showcases the, the power outage as well. Do we show the power outage? Well, why not show at this club? You know, it makes it seem like a big venue, seems like a bigger production, because we got a little concert thing going on here. But also to tell people that, hey, the power's out, and if it's out here, it's going to be out other places as well. <laughs> Just looked at my time. Big old blackout. Kind of like New York in the days of the 44 caliber killer, Son of Sam. Oh, they able to escape. 
That's why you need to have a generator. Too cheap to buy a generator, I guess. If they had a generator, maybe they'd be able to <laughs> survive. Oh, here they come. I really do just get the hell out of there and run. Like, they're walking towards you. I would just get out and just run. I don't know why the bright idea was to go in the closet. Was he not able to get out? I'm trying to think. No, I mean, the door's all open. And... I sure just ran. I mean, the door's right there. He, there's, he was right near it. Just make a run for him. Just daddle. Get the hell out of Dodge. It's a bad idea to hide there. You're not Jamie Lee Curtis, okay? You're not going to be poking with wire hangers. <laughs> now, of course, we don't have the one guy because we got to hide his face, and we don't have Jack Pounds because he doesn't want to kill someone. His tear, you know, he didn't want his tear to kill anybody, so. Just beating the hell out of him. Does he, I'm trying to remember if it break his back or something. Yep. Right across his knee. Of course, the uh, insert of a dummy there. But, you know, it works for what it needs to accomplish. I forgot, see, like, I forgot Donald Pleasance disappears. Cause it's been a while since I've seen this. I'm like, do we see Donald Pleasance again? And we don't, do we? Which, if that's the case, that's a shame that we don't see Donald Pleasance again. Even, like, at the end of the film. Like, maybe... You think it'll be like Dr. Loomis and get there, but he gets there late. No, I, I think he gets there later. No, I think he gets there later and he, he gets killed, I think. I think he does, yeah. I think Marlon Landau kills him. I think. I think that's the case. Like I said, I haven't watched this film tons of times to remember every detail. At least it's been a while since I've seen this. I'm thinking, well, maybe this. Is, well, you know, find out, find out together. Yeah, in fact, you probably know more than me. <laughs> but again, I would assume, like, if you're a slasher fan, this may disappoint you because.
There's not a whole lot of big body count. Because that's the thing. Steal all the shit. Worth any riot. Steal everything you can. Because, you know, the cops, you know, they're not going to be able to arrest everybody. And the cops, they don't want to be too busy doing other stuff, so... These guys would be saying, like, free to, to do whatever they can, whatever they want. I never, I mean, that's the other thing, like, with riots, like, there are riots that happen because of such morally good reasons, as they put it. Morally just reasons as to why this riot happens. What does you stealing, I don't know, clothes, or stealing money, stealing, I don't know, a refrigerator, or PlayStation 5, what does you stealing that do anything and have anything to do with your moral or racial morality you want to employ or imply <laughs> more like implode Ah, oh, this is where the the bleeder gets the uh, hockey mask. There we go. Before Jason Voorhees, this might be the first killer with a hockey mask. Now, of course, the hockey mask looked very different, but I'm just saying. Yeah, this might be the first killer with a hockey mask that we've seen in the movie. If there's one before, feel free to educate me. But yeah, before, just Friday the 13th, part 3, I guess technically that was 82. As well, but I think this came out before that. I think. When did Alone in the Dark... 1982 come out. <coughs> November. In the United States of America. Oh, shut up. November 12th, 1982. When did Friday the 13th Part 3 come out? August. In the United States. Okay, so Friday the 13th Part 3 technically came out August of 1982, and then this came out. November. So this came out after, but they were made fairly early on that no one would know what the other was doing. So yeah, I guess technically, Jason with the Hot Demons was first, because that came out August. Then this came out November, so there you go. So, so Jason still wins. <laughs> Jason is still the first. <coughs> there you go. Unless there's something before that, and then you let me know. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to double check on that. <clears throat> yeah, I think this is where, yeah, there's another body count right there. Ripping some, ripping a bit out of. I just double one, we had to have another person on the body count. 
a little bit of blood gore for the audience. Just the first hill, it was just you know, breaking someone in half. So here you have to see a little bit of gore. Plus we have to have that guy separate so when he comes back later, we think he's just this regular guy, then, oh, he's bleeding from the nose, okay. Funny enough, kind of like Valentine many, many, many years later, the one with Angel, David Boreanaz, from the TV show Angel, and before that, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and about the killer with the, the, Cupid, I was sure, the, the, that mask, which always looked like the Campbell Soup Kid. Valentine was a 2001 or so. It always looked like the, the Campbell Soup. Kid, I was the Campbell Soup killer. And then, uh, it's a killer that bleeds. And but I mean, granted, how many decades had that been? And I, I highly doubt any of them ever seen this film. So, I do think that was a coincidence. If it was someone in a hockey mask like that, or someone, it, it, they're two very different types of slashers as well. Well, yeah, I guess in this instance, Jab would be killing someone with the the van and the mailman. Dude, right off the road. Marlando does have a good tackle, a good laugh. <laughs> Just this evilness to it. Oh, chat's not having it. Up oh, there you go. Maybe the argument someone could have is maybe he's not dead, he's just wounded, knocked out, but I mean, I'm just going to assume the guy's dead. Maybe that's how it was explained to Jack Palance. Well, you know, he's not dead, you know, we don't know if he's dead. So that's, by, I'm assuming the guy's dead. So that's three on the body count. I think the next one's going to be the knife in the bed thing that was in, very prevalent in the trailers. Who did it? No, no titties. No titties. Boo hoo. Cue the Price is Right losing sound effect. <laughs> of course, it's been established that they're on their way to this place. More land out scene of someone's home. Well, just to be fair, they want the doctor himself. Make sure where he's at. <clears throat> She's like, what the hell is this guy's problem? <laughs> Josh Shoulder said that the character Donald Pleasant is based on a Scottish psychiatrist, R.D. Lane, who espoused a similar philosophy regarding the treatment of mentally ill patients. Video disc in 1982, DVD by Image Entertainment, 2005. Shaw Factor released a Blu ray in 2021. Yeah, Jazz Shoulder looking at his films. There's Donald Pleasant again. 
I did, and, and a few years later, did Number on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge, which was a hit. Good film. Then he did The Hidden. I forgot he did Renegades. That was with T. Free Sutherland and Lou Diamond Phillips. Completely forgot about that. By Dawn's Early Light, an HBO movie. 1201, which I've heard of. I think that's like Groundhog Day, like a sci fi thriller version of Groundhog Day. Has Jonathan Silverman from Weekend of Bernie's. Jeremy Piven, Martin Landau, who is in this film. Stitch Artist 2, but Jeff Fahey and Corny Cox. Never heard of that one. That was 1995. Generation X, I forgot he directed that TV pilot. I haven't seen that since it aired. No. Did I see when it was aired? Um, no. Oh, what? Uh, maybe it was like taped on a VHS tape and it was sent to me by my aunt. Maybe. I don't know. If, if not, then I've only seen clips of it. Wishmaster 2, a rat did. That was the giant spider movie I was thinking of. Beeper from 2002, which has Harvey Keitel, Joy Lauren Adams. Hmm. Crime film, and then 12 Days of Terror, a short movie with John and Reese Davies. Hmm. And that was 2004, so he has not done anything for 20 years. For 20 years, he hasn't done anything. Now, of course, you got the idea Erlen Van Lith may like the kids a bit too much. But just how nonchalant this girl is with the guy, like. The fact that she's not scared or anything. It's a tad weird. Like, you don't really know much of who this guy is. <laughs> so, this is just a 6.0 on IMDb. Yeah, this is the era you had the Hell Knight just before dawn, the Prowler, like just a ton of different types of films. So look at some trivia. One of the members of the Sick Fucks ran into Star Jack Pounds years later in the streets of New York. He said to Pounds that he was one of the sit fucks in the film, and Pounds replied, We're all sit fucks in that movie. <laughs> in the script, Jack Pounds' character was supposed to kill the driver outside the haven. But he refused to do the same saying it wasn't necessary for him to be seen killing someone for the audience to know that he was a dangerous character. Well, technically, he hit someone with a van. In the original script, the punk band that Tony drags the two to see was named Nitty Nothing in the Hives. An actual punk group, the Sid Futch, blended the gig. Their real name was liked so much that they kept it for the film. Again, the original idea was mental pictures steeping during a block down New York and the mafia being used to stop them. I mean, that kind of, that'd be an interesting idea. I kind of still want to see that idea. <laughs>
Apparently, Matthew Broderick auditioned for the role of Bunty's boyfriend, but Josh Shiller thought he was too talented for the small part. I mean, I don't know how much I buy that. Why would you not want someone who's talented, let alone too talented? Like, what, do you want a bad actor for your movie? So, I don't know about that. More, probably more like, okay, maybe he auditioned because this is before War Games. This is before those films. So, it's like, you didn't like something about him, maybe. Like, you thought he was his looks or something, mannerisms. But, yeah, too talented? I don't know about that. I mean, he's a good actor, but I'm just saying, I don't know. Sorry, I'm just looking through the trivia. The house that was used for Dr. Power's home in the film actually did belong to a psychiatrist. Mm. Kind of just repeating the same trivia here. And we're going to get a bit more of the body count here. We've had what three so far? I think these two are next. <coughs> I don't remember how they did it. <coughs> I think the girl gets strangled from the big guy. Erlen Van Lith. I forgot him. I think maybe Martin Landau. Is it with the axe or something? <clears throat> I think. That's what you do for hunting pussy. <laughs> you die for it. <laughs> so I guess this is the character that Matthew Broderick auditioned for. Or does he get pulled under the bed? Is that what it is? He just pulled under the bed, maybe? Maybe. I'd Like I said, it's been a while since I've seen this, so... I don't remember all the details. But what they say with horror is sex equals death. You get a little bit of your slasher bit there, a little bit of nipples, a little bit of titties. So this is definitely the scene that comes closest to the slasher film vibe. There's one of those where we gotta have at least one scene and like it and here you go. <laughs> and here you go. So we gotta have at least one. So they're arguing about what to do next. That's why I'm wondering, does he get pulled under the bed? Okay. 
Or is he tail with the ad? Like, that's why I get confused with certain things. Or is it more Landau with an axe? No, he gets pulled under the bed when he comes back, right? Yep, there we go. And then you have the knife going through the bed, which is, a, I mean, pretty hairy situation. The idea where, like, jump off, but then it's like, okay, there's someone under the bed, you're for... <clears throat> but you, like, jump off and make a run for it. Definitely a hairy situation. But at the same time, you know it's not really cool to stay on the bed, so you need to get the hell out of Dodge, like, right now. Damn it. Move, bitch. Get out the way. What are you doing? Move, bitch. Get out the way. God damn it. Get out the way. You get the fuck out of it. Just move, bitch. <laughs> Jump off the bed. See, there you go. You don't get killed. Not that it matters because she don't turn and the big guy's right there. So it's not that it matters. There you go. Yep. She just choked. Apparently no special effects were done for that. It's just, that's just... He just did that for real. I'm assuming maybe her his other hand kind of be on her back and kind of lift it like that so she's not outright choking. Or like maybe a place with his other hand. <clears throat> so that's a body count of five now. But that's the thing, it's not a lot of gore. It's not a lot of gore. You saw a little bit with the bleeder, but it's all been pretty bloodless kills. I'm sure that was the intention. I'm sure that was Josh Shoulder's intention. Uh, I mean, at least uh, on the flip side, uh, I just there's a bit of disappointment. I mean, you know, you do want to see a bit of the the special effects and this type of stuff. It works without it, sure. Would have been a nice bonus, yes. Ah, uh, here we go. Spoiler, that's the bleeder. But, I'll be honest, like, when I first saw this, I didn't put two into the other. So, when that hap when the reveal happened, I was actually surprised. And I feel like an idiot, because, like, oh, of course... There's a reason why we never saw his face. There's a reason why his face was hidden. He's disappeared. The movie hasn't shown where he went to. But I guess I just assumed he just pissed off and like all the other crazy people are out there. But at the same time, like, no, really only those four left. You would at least think to see, like, Oh, we caught him, or with something else, you know, some dialogue, something about it. So I felt dumb not figure that out, but, oh well. <clears throat> Definitely interesting to see Dwight Schultz play a different character compared to... Murdoch from the A team just being so used to him playing that type of character. Yeah, Donald Pleasance later goes up to see Dwight Schultz and then he gets killed because he tries to talk him down and be sweet and be nice. And I, I think it is Martin Landau that, that kills him. Which, I mean, Martin Landau had the nightmare involving him, Donald Pleasance, so of course he'd be the one that. Which was a bummer to see Donald Pleasance, his tater get killed.
Because I'm, I think also when I first saw this, I thought everything was going to happen in one night. Like, because the blackout, and then everything's going to happen in one night. So I was a bit surprised when I first saw this. Oh, well, it's daytime, now it's night again. I'm like, okay, so that's what's going on. Didn't have a big deal, but I was just a bit surprised. Oh shit. And yeah, there's a part where I kind of wished Dry Schultz went to Straw Dogs mode. But maybe that'd be deemed as too typical, or maybe they don't think it would be appropriate because you know he's got all his family here or something. I don't know. So yeah, we've had five people die so far, and I know this cop's gonna get it. And Donald Pleasant gets it, so that's at least seven. Yeah, this cop's outside. <coughs> They'll get it too. I swear someone gets like a bow to the chest or something because they did have the crossbow so I can't remember was it this cop or someone else I've been here. It might be here, like arrow gets into his chest, right? Is trying to build suspense, trying to increase the tension. You know something's going to happen, it's no matter when. <clears throat> Are you alone in the dark? Bit of a jump steer type of thing with the window, and then. I think coming up here, yeah. I think he does deal with arrows. Or is it... Oh, maybe it's more lined out with the axe. Maybe this is what I was thinking about. Where he, I know he did something with an axe. Maybe it's this one here. Yeah, more might be behind this tree on the left. That might be the case. Is it more land out with an axe? Will not be on the tree, so that again shows how much I remember this. <laughs> when he turns around. Oh, there's the arrow. There you go. Uh, my first thing that I said was the arrow. Ooh. I like that little detail that he stuck to the tree and his feet are not touching the ground.
And maybe that's why the, like, the bleeder, who this guy is, why he kind of caught me off guard the first time I watched it, because I'm like, he's warning him not to go out there, but he knows that's what they want, is to kill him, but he warned him not to go out there, he helps fight them off for a bit, but at the same time, I mean, he's crazy, I mean, if they're acting normal, <laughs> then they wouldn't be crazy. <clears throat> Thank God the little girl they didn't have her scream incessantly throughout it. Which would be a natural reaction, but with for a movie to be very irritating. <clears throat> That's okay, take your time, lady. Slowly walk up. You know, it's not like we have a dead cop out there. Of course there's no power yeah, you know, the phone's out. Of course it, the phone's out. Call is coming from inside the house. <clears throat> hey, she has the right instinct to not go up there by herself. She has the right instinct. <laughs> she got a point. <laughs> I mean, can't blame him. I mean, can't blame her for thinking that. <laughs> Being cautious. <laughs> it is interesting that the little girl is like not talking like how any typical girl would talk in this situation. But at least it makes her more interesting and less irritating. <clears throat> yep, get that in there. Come on, put you back into it. That would do it. So now the siege movie truly begins. Well, that was a waste of an arrow. You knew it wasn't going to get anywhere, so why'd you shoot in the first place? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out what the hell to do next.
up oh, there's Donald Pleasance. <sighs> Sally's going to get killed, which is a damn shame. That's the thing, he's just oblivious. That's the word to use, oblivious. Just does not realize the trouble he's in. Completely oblivious. Again, I hate that his terror dies. It is what it is, though. It's not the way to do it, man. It's not the way to do it. They're not going to care. And they're not going to care one iota about it, man. Up here's Born Land now. Probably still with that paranoid bits of, uh, the beginning. And they're trying to warn him. They're trying to warn him. He just doesn't want to listen. I think he just gets stabbed with a knife. <laughs> oh, cuts his ear. Those damn rugs. Oh, there's more land out with the axe. I remember that visual. I was trying to remember when it came up upon. Here it is here. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And I guess you figure out what happened next. Which is fine, I mean, I didn't need to see Donald Pleasant get killed. Yeah, that's one instance that a cutaway I'm I'm fine with. Yeah, I guess that's the idea that the door is open and did his business. Damn, damn shame. You're pretty much all too waiting for this family to fight back. I mean, we got about 19 minutes left, and even if it's like two minutes for the credits, so that's about 17 minutes. So. Question, what are you gonna do about it?
sorry I'm not saying anything. I'm not sure what to say during this part of the movie. It pretty much this standstill between the two where they're out there and they're in there. Pretty much the preparement for battle in a way. And you see that Jack Palance is pretty much nowhere to be seen throughout a lot of this. So yeah, I mean, granted, there's a part of me that would have been great that if Jack Pounds, I'm going to be the, the crazed, menacing killer. I get these intense sequences of Jack Pounds doing his business, but, you know. There's a par other part I liked as well that I mentioned before. Uh, of course, that's the question. What are you going to do now? Damn. <laughs> Hell of a throw. Is that poor cop? Of course, you have the girl that doesn't want to do anything. Just stand there with the thumb up her ass. Not helping at all. She's, she's scared and shrill and ah. <clears throat> build intention, build intention, build intention. Yep, let's go to the open window when we've seen that they shoot arrows. Makes a lot of sense. We've seen that they shoot arrows that could that killed that cop, so let's go to an open window. Just the idea is who opened this window. That's the thing. Who could have opened this window and whoever did is inside. But let's not warn anybody. Let's not scream, shout, do anything. That was a weird bit. Of, I forgot about that. I heard, I don't know if this is true, but I heard like Tom Zavini came in to do that effect. I don't know if that's true, but that's what I've heard. Yeah, that seemed like such a random thing to put in there. I, no wonder I forgot all about it. I just to show her state of mind, but I mean, that's random. Well, also the idea of a, a jolt to the audience. It's a bit cheap, but you know, it is what it is. The fact that he still didn't take a weapon kind of makes me annoyed by Dwight Schultz's character. Like, even at this point, you're not going to take a weapon when a guy gives you one. Just silly, stupid arguments to have at this time. Well, there you go. Dumb and dumber.
So you're dull. Take that, Martin Landau. <laughs> Man, that was a quick fire to put out. <laughs> Did that fast, you need to be a firefighter, man. <sighs> oh, shit. Ooh, good thinking, girl. <laughs> Up, right in the back. I did that. I think that's what caught me off guard. Is that, oh, yeah, I guess he's a good guy because he killed Erlen Van Lith here, right in the back. But I guess, to be honest, he really had no... Um, wasn't like his pal or anything. Yeah, I don't know if it's split personality or what the deal is, but decent effect to have him not only having his bat, but then hit the baseball, then bed it further. You tell there's probably a bit cut out there. It seemed that the cut was a bit too snappy, so I would not be surprised if there was a bit longer. Maybe not, but I wouldn't be surprised. But of the three, there's one guy down. Jack Pound, I mean, uh, Jack Pound's the door to be seen, and Mar Landauer got knocked out for a bit. <clears throat> of course, the car won't start. Come on. Oh, is he go to? Yep. There's. See, that reminds a lot of Valentine. The very ending where he's hugging and then the blood dripping from the nose. That reminds me quite a bit of Valentine years and years later. How do you not notice all this stuff on your face? I would notice a bunch of stuff dripping on my face and merely go, what the hell? Why is she not noticing? Her eyes are down. She can't see the blood. She can't feel it. Or is she just supposed to be stunned? And then it's like, oh, well, he's nervous. He's bleeding. He has a nosebleed. Well, she says the bleeder. So obviously she knows. There you go, do your thing. Hmm. <clears throat> but I'm sure that's supposed to be the case, is that it's not easy to kill someone. In real life, it would be a lot tougher than it would. So I, I do get that sentiment. I get why they did it that way. And then the families working together. So one killer killed another. The daughter gave the mom the knife and she killed the second killer. And here's the last one. Well, not really, but kind of really. There you go. Now you need Dry Schultz to do it. There you go. Well, Dwight Schultz is able to do something. Oh yeah, Jack Palance realizes he was wrong all along. 
to him as a revenge mission for this doctor that supposedly was murdered. <clears throat> yeah, the power goes back on and realizes how wrong he was. That's the thing with insanity is that you think reality is one thing, 100% one, one thing, while the others maybe did it for well, their own crazy bit of business or fun or whatever. This guy, it was truly like a revenge mission. Maybe he was a former soldier. Maybe you the repeal W something that people in the line of fire that die and he couldn't save or whatever his backstory is. But how lucky it is that I only do the power come out but it has the same doctor right then and there. <laughs> how lucky is that? <laughs> you know how lucky is that? That idea not only does the power come out come back on at that time, but it's on the right channel. And that if that program was on ten minutes later, fifteen minutes later, an hour later, it was on ten minutes before, it was on fifteen minutes before. Man, they be shit out of luck. Well it's one arrow, so the others I just could overpower them, but And that's what makes this ending a bit more interesting than, than other flicks. You really see this conflicted nature on him. This guy was truly lost and truly... Maybe a guy realizing he's insane or something like Whatever you want to put into it. So this is a guy that pretty much just had his world turned upside down. What he believed was right was wrong, and what he believed was true was false. And now, maybe it's given more doubts of what, who, when, what is real, what is not. Who can he believe, who can he not believe. So you get this ending where <laughs> he's in this world of craziness, and who's the real crazy person? Is the person with the gun or is the person laughing? Obviously the person thinks it's a fake gun, but even with a fake gun I wouldn't be laughing, but she's laughing. <laughs> well gotta have gotta have him do something. <laughs> yeah, everybody come in. <laughs> People love that. Now this world of crazy. Again, this ending is interesting. It just made me go, what happened next? What happened to this character? We'll never know. Would have been interesting to see. But I mean, I'm not saying you need a sequel or anything. I'm just... Oh, this right here.
And then who's the real crazy person, him or her? In a world gone mad, how do you tell the difference between the sane and insane? <laughs> and yeah, I'm, I'm assuming that's what Jack's shoulder was going for. I don't, again, maybe he explains more in his commentary. If, if he did, you do feel free to explain to me more on the ending of what they were going for. It's interesting. But he's got the gun, like, as if a warning, like, don't, you know, get close to me. But then what she does here is a bit... right to her chin and she's laughing and he's laughing too like what the hell happens next it, did, it definitely gives you food for thought when the movie's over it does, definitely gives you something to think about and wonder so I'll give you that Overall, I liked it. I mean, the kills are pretty bloodless. It's definitely lacking in gore if you're going for that. Uh, sometimes there's some slow spots in there, but the cast, the cast definitely helps the film quite a bit. And you know, with that ending there, you know, the I, I like the what they did with the bleeder. I thought that was kind of neat, clever. At least to me. And overall, yeah, I, I did quite like it. I did quite like the, the movie Watch It again. So with that said, thanks Ben. Take care everyone, and we'll see you guys later. Bye-bye for now.